Today's lecture is based off of lecture notes by Sasha Nikolov and Thomas Steinke, and I'll link them on the website. Science is in a big crisis right now, and one of these crises is known as reproducibility. Um, this is in part due to an issue known as p-value hacking, or p-hacking for short. And imagine the following type of motivational setting. Imagine you're running some big biology lab or some big scientific lab, and you spend a lot of time and you spend a lot of money collecting some sort of data set. This was very expensive to produce. Uh, it took maybe years to capture. And so you've spent all this work and you have nothing to show for it so far. So what you do is you have a hypothesis on something about this data. And what you do is you test whether this hypothesis is true. Well, you know, you spent all this work, you did all this sweat and tears before with nothing to show, and you finally get to run this hypothesis test and you find out, no, your hypothesis wasn't true. Um, it seems pretty likely that it was true. Say some drug wasn't effective, you know, you found no link between two uh, features, something like that. This is a disaster because you spent all this time and money gathering this data set, and now it turned out to be useless here. Um, it didn't give you information. Well, you might think, okay, I'm not done yet. You know, I only asked one question on this data set. Like, uh, there's so many, we have this data set. Why not see if we can do more with it? So you might be tempted, okay, this didn't work out. So let's ask another question. And maybe that one doesn't work out. Uh, and you do another test and another test. And eventually you find something uh, interesting. So you find what's known as a p-value, which we're not gonna really get into, but a p-value which is less than 0 0.05, which sort of classically speaking is the threshold for uh, saying we have a scientific discovery. So this is a big deal. You finally get your p-value, uh, you celebrate, you submit a paper uh, with these findings to some prestigious journal. Um, and then it turns out that other people look at your discovery uh, and it turns out that they can't reproduce these findings. Um, in particular, uh, they, they just find that, you know, the link that you found seems to be totally bogus. They collected their own data set and, they, uh, and they, they just couldn't reproduce your findings. So maybe it turns out uh, that your findings were not in fact true. And in fact, there's a major crisis in science, which uh, there's an article which is well read, but, uh, which is well known by uh, John Unitas, which says most, why most published research findings are false. And it's due to... Um, issues kind of like this, where perhaps we're overfitting to the data set that we have and we've kind of cheated and somehow convinced ourselves using the data into believing something that is not true. So let's, let's kind of see why this happens. We're, uh, remember, we're still in the motivation phase, but let's see kind of uh, what's going on. So let me note that for now, we're not working in the differentially private setting. Uh, we're just working in, you know, we'll, we'll see later the connections with uh, differential privacy. But this is kind of how we've pictured uh, most of the analysis or most of the setups in this class so far, except for maybe the previous lecture. But we imagine there's some analyst who wants to learn something. And so they ask some question about their data set. They ask some query and they get the answer. And based on this, they'll ask some other query and they get another answer and so on. Uh, yeah, so this is great, and you can find, the analyst can find out all sorts of things about their data. The thing is, that's not really what they care about uh, in, in when an analyst is doing, uh, you know, analysis. They're not just trying to find out things about the data, they're trying to find out things about the world at large. So the idea is, the real picture, this was kind of a bit of a red herring, but the real picture is something like the following. There's really some distribution, or some population, let's say, which is a generating process. That means like there's, there's some process which really provides us with this data set or, you know, the sample, as we sometimes call it. So what the analyst cares about is not really what the data sample itself has. They really want to answer questions about, uh, about the population as a whole. For example, you know, uh, yeah, they want to, I don't know if there's really a good example to say here, but right, they want to answer something about, uh, you know, if, if it's a medical study, say they want to know if this uh, drug is effective on the entire population of humans, not really just finding out whether it's effective on the specific people they ask, because 
know, that's not really as valuable as knowing whether it's effective on the population as a whole. And so therefore, when you're doing, say, drug tests, you have to be very careful to control for settings like this. Okay, so at a high level, that's at least the type of uh, setting we're going to be focused on. Uh, I, let's, let's get a little bit more specific and uh, understand precisely what the um, technical setting that we're going to focus on. And we'll see some more examples of, say, overfitting and how it might uh, come up. In particular, we're going to see how we can prevent type of catastrophic uh, overfitting to the data set uh, using differential privacy. Okay, so we're given the setup is the following. There exists some distribution uh, D, which is on some alphabet, say X. And we want to know what fraction of the population defined by D has some property. So in particular, there is a bunch of uh, different queries that we might ask. So suppose we want to ask, say, a total of K queries. So we have Q1 all the way up to UK. Each of these are functions which uh, take our data set, or sorry, take, um, you know, uh, they can take a single uh, data point from our domain and map it to, let's just say we're mapping it to 0, 1. So this is kind of as we've used in the language earlier in this class, a counting query. It either has the property or it doesn't. Say, you know, our data set is a set of humans and this uh, Q1, say, asks, do they have red hair or not red hair? And the type of question we'd like to ask are, you know, the following, um, kind of, you know, in the language of this class, I think we've called these counting queries, uh, but also, you know, they're sometimes called statistical queries. So, we're trying to answer queries on the distribution where we have the following thing. We imagine that if a single data point, let's say X was sampled according to D, then we want to answer the, what is the expected value of this query on a, that single sample. And we want to do this for all I and K. Right, so the idea is there's several queries and we want to answer them all and basically give good estimates of this quantity. And notice, just, just let me really hammer this home, we're trying to estimate the quantity, uh, this query, when applied to the overall distribution, uh, not on some specific data set. So now the classic way of uh, handling this problem is, uh, you know, answer what the quest question is on the data set. So suppose we have some data set um, X, which is say x1 through xn, which is in say overall, uh, I guess I didn't choose the best notation of this, but um, it's in script x to the n, then, uh, and where, you know, x, xi is drawn iid, each xi is drawn iid from the unknown distribution, then the classic way that we would estimate this quantity is as follows. We would estimate it using, uh, you know, u i here, u i on x, which is equal to the you know empirical value of the query on the data set. I guess let me use j to index the uh, sample points. So this is the classic way we would estimate uh, this quantity here. Uh, the, the quantity for the overall data set, or sorry, the quantity for the distribution or the population can be estimated using the same query when applied to our data set when the data set is sampled from the distribution. So the claim is kind of the following that uh, QI of D is approximately equal to QI on X. So now this is, this is, you know, how, how, how accurate is this? Or let, let's be a bit more quantitative on this. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's use a Chernoff bound or the Hofting inequality or something like that to try to quantify how close this is. So what we have is the following, or rather what we desire is the following. We would like to basically answer a sequence of queries, a set of queries, uh, in the following way, uh, rather with the following guarantees. The probability that uh, 
qi on x minus qi on d is greater than or equal to alpha. Well, we would like this. Uh, and the probability for each thing to be less than 2x minus 2 alpha squared n. This is just a, uh, right, this is just a simple, um, you know, Chernoff bound. And, you know, taking a union bound over all the things, uh, over all the different queries that we're going to ask, all k queries, then this gives the following. Uh, we have that uh, probability that there exists i such that, you know, this difference, qi of x minus qi of d is greater than or equal to alpha. Well, we can just use a union bound, and that gives us uh, sorry, that this probability is going to be less than or equal to 2 times k times x of minus 2 alpha squared n. So that's uh, great. We want, suppose we want that uh, this probability is less than or equal to beta. So essentially, what do we want? We want to be able to ask a number of queries. We want to ask queries q1 through qk. We want to use the empirical mean of this, each query on the data set to uh, you know, estimate the uh, query on the distribution. And we'd like the fat probability that any of them is significantly off from the true answer to be less than beta. So, okay, let's see what this gives us if we you know, solve for this. Uh, we want, in particular, we want sort of this inequality to hold. So what does that give us? That gives us, you know, we need that 2m over beta is less than or equal to x of minus 2 alpha squared n. Taking the log of both sides and, uh, oh, sorry, no, there shouldn't be a minus here now. Point of bringing it to the other side. And so then this uh, is kind of equivalent to needing uh, that, if you take the log of both sides and divide by 2 alpha squared, that gives us that we need n to be greater than or equal to, uh, oh shoot, I switched uh, symbols here. This is k. Write that in a different color. Uh, this requires that uh, log of 2k over beta is greater than or equal to 2 alpha squared. So, okay, what have we just said here? We said that, uh, we said that, um, well, like, how did, how do we arrive here at this and what does it say? So we're saying the following. Imagine you have a set of queries and you ask them all on your data set. Then the probability that any of them differs uh, from your, uh, the true mean is going to be less than or equal to uh, beta. And this is true as long as you have that n is greater than or equal to log of k over beta divided by two alpha squared. So kind of, kind of just to like isolate the key parts of this, we need that uh, n is greater than or equal to say log of k. That means you can kind of ask, uh, you know, exponentially many uh, queries in your data set size. Sorry, in, in uh, the number, as long as you're, how, what's the best way to say this? Um, I just want to say that you can essentially answer exponentially many queries before you run into issues. Uh, yeah, let, let me just write this a different way. Um, if you take e to the both sides, that's sort of like equivalent to saying that as long as k is less than or equal to like e to the n, something like this, then you're okay. So this is pretty nice because that allows you to ask quite a few queries if you have a reasonably sized data set. However, the downside of this is the way that we did our analysis uh, in the sense that kind of what we uh, assumed here implicitly was that uh, essentially each of these things were independent. Uh, this assumes some sort of strong sort of independence.
And that was kind of present in when we were applying the chernoff hofting inequality right here. Uh, in particular, if you know we didn't have uh, if we didn't have this independence, then we wouldn't necessarily have the type of guarantee we want. So in other words, we were kind of really in an okay shape here just because of the fact that we asked uh, we asked the query sort of we specified the queries ahead of time and we didn't do any sort of adaptation. However, it's not too hard to see that uh, if you don't have independence, if the queries are chosen adaptively, then things can go really bad. So yeah. Bad news. Adaptivity. So let's see a simple, uh, oh, I guess the non-adaptive analysis is essentially what I did here. So let's skip over this page. So let's see what goes wrong adaptively. There's a very simple example, which uh, you'll see, you know, makes things, uh, makes things very nice. In particular, uh, what we're going to do is uh, give a very easy example. So like, let's, let's for now assume that uh, our data domain is one through K. And think of this K as being very, very large. Okay, so now what we're going to do is, what we're going to do is we're going to let the um, ith query essentially be uh, asking whether the data point is equal to I. So let's write this here. Uh, so remember that uh, Q of I on, this is a function. Q of I is a function from the data domain to say, 0, 1. And so in particular, let's take a Q I of say, X to be equal to 1 if X is equal to I and 0 else. So essentially, what this type of query will do when applied to a uh, data set is it would, uh, it would essentially tell you what fraction of the data set has that given value. So then what we can do is ask the series of questions. So the analyst, analyst can ask the queries, say Q1 of X all the way up to Q of K of X. So they'll discover exactly, the, they'll essentially learn exactly the data set. And why is this? Because, you know, the first query will tell you exactly how many uh, values are equal to one in the data set. The next one will tell you how many are equal to two. And then that last one over here will tell you exactly how many are uh, equal to uh, K. So, now, the issue here is, let's suppose that once you do this, you've learned the data set. Now you can ask, it's possible that each of these by themselves would be actually um, representative of what the answer is in terms of the true data set. In particular, we could have specified these all in advance and just ask them on our data set, and that would be okay kind of by this, uh, this type of analysis we did here. However, the issue will come when we ask the following, Q of K plus one. Now we're going to ask some query, which really just ruins everything. And, you know, we'll get a very different answer on our uh, sample data set than what we would on the true data set itself. So let's ask the following query. We'll have, uh, you know, the query on a, uh, the K plus one's query. We'll have, you know, the value one if x is in x and zero else. So this is a very simple query. Um, recall that you can actually compute this query because of the fact that uh, you know, this, is, this is the data set. So you can compute it uh, yourself if you're running it on the empirical data set based on the results of the first k uh, queries. But let's see what the issue is. 
The issue is the following. So Q on uh, K plus one, Q K plus one on the disk data set X is equal to one, kind of by definition. For each point in the data set, it's going to give you a one if it's true, uh, if, it, if it's in the data set or not, and zero otherwise. Um, but the, diff, the, the issue is that Q of K plus one on the data set is going to be less than or equal to N over K. Um, and remember, I said, told you to picture the case where K is uh, very, very large. Then, in fact, in this case, you won't be able to, uh, you know, th there, there's a huge gap in terms of the two. This one will be, you know, telling you that the query um, one, everyone satisfies this predicate. Uh, but this one kind of says that, uh, you know, this is going to be the, the true sort of fraction of the data or the distribution which satisfies this is going to be rather small, uh, unless you take a really significant uh, number of samples n. So this shows that, uh, let, let me say that, uh, we really wanted, uh, like, unless n is equal to omega of k, no generalization. So generalization is this kind of uh, phenom. Let, let me just comment two things here. Generalization is this kind of phenomenon where you answer something on some empirical data set you have, and then it reflects something about the distribution as a whole. So here, um, we answered something on our data set, but we can see here that uh, when you answered on the distribution, there's going to be quite a gap. So this did not generalize appropriately because we weren't really careful. And the other thing I want to point out is this example, if we wanted it to be accurate, we would perhaps need that n is at least uh, k. But the thing is that, uh, you know, before what we saw is what, that we would be fine as long as n was greater than or equal to log k. So we see now that there is an exponential gap in terms of the uh, number of things that we can answer. This one, before we could add, answer exponentially many, but here now we can only answer sort of linearly many. Uh, for this sort of thing. So, okay, there's a few different, there, there's some, there's a naive solution we can do. The naive so solution is what's known as uh, sample splitting. So what we would do is imagine you have some data set X and you want to run K analyses. Uh, and what you do is like essentially just split X into K parts. And then run analysis on each part. Basically the I th or not, not maybe this is a bit misleading. Let me um, say this a bit differently. Run I th query on ith part. And the idea is the following. Essentially, by the analysis we uh, you know, saw in the first uh, part of this uh, lecture, you can see that if uh, you know, running, what's the best way to do this? So let's call these uh, you know, x1 all the way up to x sub k, uh, essentially running, you run qi on x sub i. And the analysis will say that, uh, you know, this is approximately equal to uh, qi on the distribution if n is greater than or equal to, what is it like, something like log m over beta, or sorry, log this up log k over beta over alpha squared uh the thing what, what do i mean by this this is n of uh subset i essentially saying that if you know your i subset of the data is uh sufficiently large then uh you're going to be okay but the thing is we have uh 
k different parts here. So we need overall that n is greater than or equal to k log k over beta over alpha squared. So you can see the downside here. Um, the downside is the fact that, you know, before we just could do away with, you know, logarithmically many uh, samples. But this time, we need that uh, there's linearly many samples, essentially, in terms of the number of uh, queries we want to ask. Today, I'm going to present something that essentially shows that you can do uh, n is greater than or equal to, let's say you can do square root of k log uh, 2k over beta log 1 over alpha beta all over alpha squared. So you can see here that um, this is sort of quadratically better. You know, you saved a square root factor. And it turns out this is kind of uh, roughly optimal. So just, just compare it to, you know, the uh, different sort of regimes. Uh, we have that this is like the, this is sort of like, the naive setting, where if we just uh, did it um, adaptively, we'd have, and we want to be valid, then we would have to use uh, k times the amount of data. Um, recall that, you know, log k is the non-adaptive. But sort of somewhere in the middle, at square root k, is the best we can do if we do it adaptively. Not as good as we had before, but better than a square quadratically better than this. Um, yeah, what do I want to say? Do I want to mention? I'll mention to you that there's also another bound that you can do, um, which looks something like the following. Suppose you're in the case where, you know, you you maybe there's a lot of queries, you have k very, very large, and you need to do better. Then you can do something more like um, the following arcane quantity, which might be familiar to some of you who have been paying very close attention in this class. Right. Um, so this is also approximately optimal if you have a finite domain. But yeah, this is, these are kind of like two different algorithms which both work, um, which work in different settings, uh, which work, which rather are very good in different settings. This one is in, good in the setting where you might have a very, very large domain, potentially infinite domain, which your, query, which your data set is over. But if you have a lot of queries, but uh, sort of not too big size of domain for your data, then this bound will be better. And yeah, so those are the two uh, types of bounds that you can uh, give to essentially be able to uh, get good, uh, you know, sample complexity for these problems. And how are we going to do this? Well, the way we do this is using uh, differential privacy, as perhaps there should be no surprise to you since we're, you know, 12, 16 lectures in uh, to this class. So yeah, there's a very nice connection between adaptive data analysis and uh, differential privacy. In some vague sense, what went wrong with uh, the analysis that the analysts did before, where they just kind of took whatever the data sample gave them and takes that uh, value exactly? Well, the issue here is that they kind of learned too much about the data sample when they didn't really care about the data sample. Instead, what we're going to imagine is that, uh, you know, kind of how we've been looking before, that they don't actually interact directly with the data sample. We're going to imagine that there's kind of a box here, which is a you know, DP mechanism. And they, everything they, every way they interact with the data sample will be differentially private. What this will enforce is that they don't, in some sense, learn too much about the individual data points, and they'll learn something more about the data set, or the, about the distribution as a whole. Uh, they don't get too precise answers to any of their questions, which will prevent them from overfitting. And yeah, this is this kind of like the high-level idea. Um, 
And a little bit more formally, like the type of guarantee is the following type of guarantee. This is what's known as a transfer theorem, which essentially says we can transfer the guarantees that we have from, uh, from um, you know, uh, a differentially private analysis into a, uh, into a generalizing analysis. So let's uh, see what we have here. Um, let me just change this to one little notation. So what does this theorem say? Suppose that the mechanism M takes N IID samples X from this uh, distribution D, and we answer K queries Q1 through QK on this data set with the following two guarantees. So essentially, we just answer these queries in some way, like you could do the empirical mean um, and add Gaussian noise, or you could do something else. Um, well, yeah, we'll, I'll talk about that a bit in a second. But essentially, in some way, you answer Q1 through QK on this data set. And you have the following two guarantees. One is that uh, the query values are sort of accurate. So this is what the query would get on the data set. And you output something, like you output something that goes through this algorithm, which is alpha close. Yeah, it says that, you know, the probability that any of these is greater than alpha is less than beta. So it says that essentially, the point one here says that, you know, M is accurate on data set. Of course, you know, the one with the algorithm where M is just the one that uh, outputs exactly what QI of X is, that's very accurate on the data set. However, it doesn't uh, satisfy the other thing, uh, which is that M is private. Now, you might think this is kind of weird, like, you know, we need alpha, alpha, beta, but this is just kind of the setting of parameters which make things work out. And in particular, if you have these two things, that M is accurate on the data set, and that M is private, then this conclusion here essentially says that QI on X, uh, you know, the values uh, on the data set, I, I guess this should really be like M, uh, MI on X, the probability that MI on X, uh, the probability that it's differing from the value on the uh, uh, query on the value on the uh, distribution, the probability that it differs a lot is less than uh, beta. So this is a uh, nice transfer theorem. And if you want to summarize, it says, imagine you have some, uh, some, you have some algorithm which is private on the data, which is private, and it's also accurate on the data set, then it will, the answer that it gives you will generalize. So this is a very nice result. Let me just give a little bit of uh, bibliographic information. So this sort of connection between differential privacy and generalization is kind of a little bit folklore, but uh, the connection in the sort of setting of adaptive data analysis um, was sort of first discovered by Dwork, uh, Feldman, uh, Hart, Kitasi, Reingold, and Roth. So this was first discovered by them in like 2015 roughly. This transfer theorem as uh, stated here was uh, slightly after that, uh, it, which was by Basili, Nassim, Smith, Steinke, Stemmer, and Ullman. And I think this one was maybe 2016, 17, something like that. Um, but yeah, it essentially shows uh, this stronger transfer theorem than was given in the first work, uh, which results in kind of these better um, sample complexity bounds. So you'll notice that, you know, naturally this sort of adaptive data analysis uh, area is, uh, is a very, you know, very closely related to differential privacy. You should hopefully recognize many of these names so far in these, in these, uh, um, from this class. In particular, say three out of four of these folks here are, um, uh, you know, some of the inventors of differential privacy. I guess to complete the picture, Frank McSherry is sometimes credited with the observation that uh, 
you know, uh, differential privacy allows generalization in sort of simpler settings. So from up here as well. But really, all of these people pretty much are giants also in differential privacy. So like, there's a very strong relationship between the differential privacy community as well as the um, uh, as well as the adaptive data analysis community. Cool. So yeah, this is the transfer theorem which is showed at uh, BNSSU. Um, what we're not we're not going to show that today because it gets a little bit technical in some points. Um, there is a simpler, uh, a simpler proof of um, a transfer theorem like this, which was actually recently accepted to, or no, this was about a year old now, ITCS 2020. Um, but there is one by Zhang, Leggett, Neil, Roth, uh, Sharifi, Mal, but charity and Schenfeld. And this one is from 2020, which I'll also link on the website. Um, but yeah, this is kind of a simpler proof uh, of, you know, a transfer theorem. And it's a stronger one than what we're going to prove today. Just going to keep it kind of simple for today's lecture. But yeah, you should check it out and uh, read it. It could be of interest to you, some of you. Yeah, a lot of names here, as I think. Uh, uh, yeah, it seems like, I think Aaron might have said one time that it seems like an adaptive data analysis or transfer theorem takes six authors to prove every time. Um, yeah, so, okay, we're going to, let me introduce what a simpler transfer theorem is and what we're going to uh, sort of prove in the second video today, uh, in the next video, um, which is an easier transfer theorem. Uh, Sorry, let, actually, before I do that, let me just uh, sort of make two comments behind, uh, you know, I told you this transfer theorem, which says uh, if, you do, uh, if you do an analysis which is both accurate and differentially private, then you get something which generalizes. That seems a little bit abstract, so we can instantiate this into understanding some of the cases which we've already, like, what, what, what should M be, essentially, is the question I'm asking. And, you know, there's a few different things. Uh, we can use here as the algorithm M. One algorithm M that we could plug in here is just the Gaussian mechanism. In particular, if you plug in the Gaussian mechanism and just compute exactly uh, what type of um, you know, alpha and beta you need here, that'll uh, give you the following uh, theorem, the one basically that I mentioned right here. And why is this natural? Well, essentially, where does the square root K come from? Uh, this square root k right here is essentially the exact same square root k as, you know, from advanced composition. So there's some kind of a uh, link here between advanced composition and the number of queries we can answer. Now, I told you that this is not the only bound. If you have, uh, you know, a lot of queries and you really want to do better than that when the domain isn't too large, then this here is just the uh, running, say, private multiplicative weights, which we talked about earlier in this class. So this shows, essentially to try to summarize this is, uh, if you run certain differentially private algorithms on your adaptive sequence of queries, then you will get things which actually, in fact, do generalize. And uh, yeah. So for the remainder of this uh, class, that is the next video we'll go over, we'll go over proof of this easier transfer theorem. Um, this will be a lot simpler to prove, but it won't be quite as strong. So let's, let's see what it says. Um, so let X be a data set generated according to some unknown distribution and let an, our algorithm be differentially private again. If we have it be, so this, 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 remember there were two conditions here, say like, you know, that's accurate and private. This says that, um, this says it's private. And we also want it to be, this, this other condition here says that it's accurate. Let's note that this is a slightly weaker notion of accuracy than before. So what we said is, is it weaker than before? It's actually, yeah, it's slightly different than before. Let's just say that. Um, before we wanted that the probability that any uh, algorithm, sorry, any query that uh, went through this um, M is, has large error the probability of that is less than beta. Whereas this time we just want that the uh, expected maximum error is going to be less than alpha. So this is kind of an expectation bound in term, instead of a high probability bound like we had before. 
So if we have that, uh, you know, the algorithm is accurate in terms of its expectation and it's private, then you have the following type of generalization bound. So it says that the difference between the query on the uh, true distribution and the values the query, uh, sorry, the private algorithm running on the uh, data set, it'll have the uh, following types of bound. You'll, you'll see that the sort of expected error, the, yeah, the expected error will be bounded by alpha plus e to the epsilon minus one uh, plus delta, which if you'd like, you know, if L epsilon is small, then this is approximately equal to alpha plus epsilon plus delta. Right, so this is what we are going to try to prove today. Again, note that it's weaker than this because this is sort of a probability or a high probability bound, whereas today we're just going to try to prove something in expectation. Um, if you care about you know, trying to get the high probability bound, perhaps this uh, most recent work is the one to try to see how that follows. But we're just going to focus on the expectation bound since it's much easier and you can see some of the nice connections. So yeah, be sure to come back in the next part to see how that works and to see a proof of that statement.